Good morning or good afternoon. I never know which to say at noon. So anyway, um, just a little bit about this. It's a part of my PhD project, so it's a tiny part of the project. And uh, what I'm doing is looking at the ideology behind the 1874 Constitution. And if any of you are watching the news, the legislature's in session, and we get to see some of the after effects of the 1874 Constitution on display today, because um, there's a very controversial issue there. So we'll start by looking, and these are not all Democrats. There's a couple Republicans thrown in here that I'll call my, part of my redeeming lights. These are the most interesting, as far as I'm concerned, delegates and their backgrounds. So as the delegates assembled on July 14, 1874, in, the Little, in Little Rock, in this very building, they represented men from a broad level of political, governmental, and business experience. Fifteen of those men had served in a constitutional convention prior to this. So 15 of them had written constitutions. 27 of the 90 delegates possessed some level of prior legislative experience. This number included John H. Williams of Little River County, a former Brigadier General in the Confederate Army, a former state senator from South Carolina where he was a planter before the war. He would feel right at home, though, since the majority of the delegates were slave owners prior to the war. Then nine African Americans served as delegates. The 1874 convention is considered by contemporaries as well as modern scholars to be one of the ablest assemblies ever put together in the state. So they had a high opinion of themselves, but historians continue to hold that opinion of this group of men. So when it came time to select a president of the convention, they're going to turn to Grandison Royston here. Royston, uh, in fact, is going to be the second choice for president. It had been widely assumed that David Walker of Fayetteville would be the president. Walker had been the president of the 1861 secession convention. He was a former chief justice of the Supreme Court. And he was a member of the 1836 convention as well. But to the great shock of most Arkansans that were tuned in to the political process, Walker had been defeated in his home county of Washington, in part due to the rising Granger movement. And while it's unclear why Washington County Grangers opposed Walker, historian Michael Dugan, formerly of ASU, has argued that, quote, a Granger revolt against taxes was underway. So delegates turned to Royston as their president. Royston here is a native of Tennessee. He was born in 1809 and moved to Arkansas Territory in 1832. In 1836, at just the age of 22, he represented Hempston County in the state's first constitutional convention. He practiced law in Washington in Hempston County, and he earned a reputation as one of the ablest attorneys in the state, if not the region. Now, not only did he serve in that first constitutional convention, but he's chosen to represent his county in the first legislature. And keep in mind, he's 22, he's in the legislature for the first time, and right upstairs here, when the Speaker of the House stabs a member of the legislature and is expelled, Royston is picked to finish his term as Speaker of the House. So when Speaker Wilson is expelled from the chamber, Royston becomes Speaker. He's going to build a relationship with the state's dominant political force, the family, the Conways, the, the Severs, and the Johnsons. And this relationship is going to, board, to bear fruit. He's going to serve in the State House of Representatives, the State Senate, and as prosecuting attorney. Andrew Jackson is going to appoint him as U.S. attorney, a job he's going to turn down. Later, President Tyler is going to appoint him as U.S. attorney. That time he's going to serve for a brief period of time. Royston is also a promoter of railroads and internal improvements. He's going to serve as an agent for the future Cairo and Fulton Railroad as early as 1838, before most people are even 
thinking about railroads in Arkansas. And when it comes to the issue of slavery, the institution's importance is hard to deny. Hempstead County had a population of 40% African Americans, and Royston, like other men of his class, owned slaves. Based on the 1860 Arkansas slave census, he owned at least 18 slaves when the war broke out. Now, he was not a secessionist. He did not support secession. In fact, he, gets, he is a supporter of staying in the Union. But once secession comes, he's going to get himself elected to the Confederate Congress. As a congressman, he's going to remain staunchly loyal to Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. He's good, and that support is actually going to contribute to his political downfall during the war. Arkansas moves away from support for Davis and the war pretty quickly. And Rufus K. Garland is going to defeat him. Garland is going to run as an anti-war candidate. So when people tell you that anti-war candidates are a new thing, that's not true at all. So here, during the Civil War, Garland's going to run as an anti-war candidate. We'll come back to him. Another issue that contributes to Royston's defeat is the fact that his son will not enlist in the Confederate Army. In fact, he is a um, kind of a wayward child in the terms of his father, and he runs around while his friends are off at war, and this has a devastating impact on his father's career. So Royston's going to come back at the end. He's going to be the president of the 1874 convention. He's kind of the wise old gentleman. So next, let's turn to White County. White County is going to elect Jesse Newton Cypret. Cypret's a lawyer and a Democrat who was born in Wayne County, Tennessee in December of 1823. He's admitted to the bar in 1849 in Crittenden County, Arkansas, before moving to Searcy. Prior to the war, he was a Whig. So that, that becomes important to the story about the 1874 Constitution. That many of these men are Whigs prior to the war. So, but after the war, he's going to become a staunch Democrat. He's a member of the Methodist Church South. He's a Mason. He's an odd fellow. And in 1860, he appears to have owned one slave. Into the 1861 Secession Convention, he gets himself elected as a Unionist. He's opposed to secession. But he embraces secession after Fort Sumter and after Lincoln calls for troops to put down the rebellion. He's going to serve in the military. Uh, he serves at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, after the Battle of Shiloh, his battalion is consolidated. But he does get himself elected major in my hometown of Pocahontas, Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas. He's made a major. But after that, he is decommissioned, and he's sent to the commissary department in Mississippi. And near the end of the war, he's arrested by Union troops, and he's sent to a prison camp right here in Little Rock. After the war, we lose a little track of, of Cypress here for a few years. We don't know everything about what's going on. But by 1868, he's sworn a loyalty oath, and he's a member of the 1868 Reconstruction Convention right here in this building. Um, he becomes the leading Democrat conservative voice in that convention, in fact. And even though the Republicans are in control, he gets a chairmanship of a committee. By the 1874 convention, he has rebounded from the war. He has real estate valued at $3,000 and personal property valued at around $1,600. And he's once again a leading voice in Arkansas politics. So Royston is one of those guys who's going to stand out throughout the convention. The 1874 convention is going to yield a number of future governors as well. William Meade Fishback would be one of those. In 1861, Fishback is a unionist. But he's going to become one of the most controversial leaders in the state's history. In fact, he has an interesting rise to power. 
his tenacious pursuit of debt repudiation after Reconstruction will ultimately make the state's financial woes worse. But Fishbeck is born in Virginia, Culpeper County, Virginia. He's educated at the University of Virginia where he graduates in 1855, so just six years before the war really gets underway. After graduation, he reads law in a local law office, as tradition has it. Um, then he moved to Springfield, Illinois, where he practiced law. And he crossed paths continuously in courtrooms with Abraham Lincoln. He found himself on the other side arguing cases against Abraham Lincoln. But he stayed in Springfield only a short time, choosing to come to Arkansas to search for greater opportunities. And he came to Fort Smith. He opens a law office in Sebastian County, and in 1861, as I already said, he gets himself elected as a unionist. And he's going to change his vote after Fort Sumter and after the call for troops. He's going to vote for secession, but almost immediately move to St. Louis, where he's going to swear a loyalty oath to the union. So he cannot make up his mind. He remains one of the most interesting cases here. Ruth Collins Cohen, writing in the Arkansas Historic Quarterly, argues, quote, William Fishback, another self-constituted union leader, with a political, was a political opportunist who now became a champion of the union. In St. Louis, he's going to become the editor of a pro-union newspaper, the St. Louis Democrat. And when Little Rock falls to Union troops, he's going to quickly move back to Little Rock or to Arkansas and come to Little Rock, where he's going to found the, uncon con the Unconditional Union, a local unionist newspaper. Now, he possessed pretty strong unionist, unionist credentials. He had done it all quickly. So by 1864, he's seen as a unionist leader in Arkansas. And with Isaac Murphy in the governor's office, Fishback is appointed senator from Arkansas to fill the unexpired term of William K. Sebastian. And due to presidential reconstruction versus congressional reconstruction and the fight there, he's never seated. So following this feudal trip to Little Rock, he returns to Arkansas. He's appointed the federal treasury agent here in Little Rock and he does that job for a short period of time. He's going to return to Sebastian County and practice law. He's going to set out the 1868 Reconstruction Convention. He's going to set out the Reconstruction years. But by 1874, he's declared himself a Democrat. So he's, he's been a Whig, he's been a Democrat, he's been a Republican. And he's going to get himself elected to the 1874 Constitutional Convention. And in this body, he's going to chair the Finance, Taxation, and Public Debt Committee. And he's going to use this position to advocate repudiating the state's debt. In other words, just saying we will not pay. Following the ratification of the 1874 Constitution, he was elected to the State House as a Democrat and eventually was elected governor. And the first amendment to the 1874 Constitution is the Fishback Amendment. And he finally got his way. He repudiates the state's debt. Arkansas becomes officially a cash-based state. We would not pay our debts, so naturally no one would loan us money. So that can be laid at Fishback's feet. Just as in the case of Fishback, other delegates to the 1874 convention changed their political stripes as well. Another was Rufus K. Garland. I mentioned him earlier. He defeated Ralston. And I'm behind on my slides, so I apologize. My students have to yell at me about that too. So Rufus K. Garland, he's going to defeat Ralston for the Confederate Congress. He's the brother of Augustus Garland. His portrait's right out here in the main hall, actually. His brother's is, I should say. In 1861, he's a Unionist delegate. He's born in Tipton County, Tennessee in 1830, and his family's going to move to Arkansas in 1834. 
So really all he knows is Arkansas. He is educated, though, in Kentucky at St. Joseph's College, Bradestown, Kentucky. And as a young man, he represented Nevada County, which becomes a county during this time. He represents Nevada County in the legislature. Based on the 18, 1860 census, he owned nine slaves, but that number, I cannot track down anything different but he and his brother and his parents owned multiple plantations. So the likelihood that he only owned nine slaves is very slim as far as I'm concerned. He also owned a significant amount of property in Hempstead County and Nevada County. The Garlands, though, are prominent Whigs. They're part of the opposition to the family. But it appears that, that Rufus Garland is going to flirt with know-nothingism, the American party, before he becomes eventually a Democrat. And the Democrat won't be his last switch. But he's, a fir he's first elected to the legislature in 1858 and re-elected in 1860. In 1861, he's selected for the secessionist convention, as I already said. And like Fishbeck, he becomes a reluctant secessionist, only embracing that after Lincoln's call for troops. He's going to serve in the Confederate infantry early in the war. But politics is always going to draw him away from that. He's going to defeat Grandston, or Grandison Royston in the congressional elections of 1863, the Confederacy what they do is they appoint interim congressmen and then they have an election and then the second set of congressmen are elected in 1863. He ran for the congressional seat on a platform supporting peace at any cost. And you say, wait a minute, how's that possible in Confederate Arkansas? But he supports peace at any cost. And he argued that the South should accept any peace terms that the North would offer. James M. Woods, a historian, refers to Garland as a, quote, Confederate copperhead. Copperheads, of course, were, were Southern sympathizers in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. In Richmond, as a congressman, Garland is going to become a thorn in the side of Jefferson Davis. He's going to quickly become the leading critic of Davis. And in 1874, he sets out Reconstruction, he rebuilds his family's finances, he's going to win election to the 1874 convention. He's elected from Nevada County as a Democrat, but unlike his brother, Augustus Garland, who would become governor later, he seems to have never fit in with the Democratic Party or accepted the Democrats' ideology. He made one more change in his political ideology over the years. He became the Greenback nominee for governor. He ran against James H. Berry and Republican W.D. Slack. Garland appears to have officially broken with the Democratic Party in 1879 over what he terms its ad adherence to inflationary policies at the national level. Garland also became a newspaper edit editor. He published the Prescott Democrat and transformed it into an organ of greenback politics. But he wasn't the only prominent Democrat to join the greenback movement. Other prominent, other prominent Democrats did as well. According to some historians, former Governor Henry M. Rector considered supporting the greenback party as well. So what I, what I want you to take away from this is that these men are not all Democrats, who often our histories tell us that they're all Democrats who agreed with each other, and that they quickly wrote a constitution without debates, without controversy. And I could talk to you for days about the issues they debated and how ugly those debates got, but we'll have to save that for another time. So another delegate here that went through some political changes is a guy named Hugh French Thomason of Crawford County. And he's going to go through multiple political identities. He's born in Tennessee in February of 1826. 
and he seems to have settled and practiced law in Washington County before moving to Crawford County. So Thomason began his political career as a Democrat, but because of his staunch opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he embraced the American or Know Nothing Party. He would be a Know Nothing nominee for Congress in 1856 from the state's northern district. But his choice of political parties seems to be driven not by opposition to Kansas and Nebraska so much as opposition to the dominant political forces in the state. Many people who opposed the family seem to have embraced no nothingism. In fact, he began his political career as a Democrat traveling, speaking against Thomas Heinemann, who was a family critic. So he's kind of all over the board in a political sense. In 1861, he's elected to the Secessionist Convention. And like a majority of the delegates, he opposes secession in the beginning. Same story, different verse. He's eventually going to change his mind. Most of us know that everyone but Murphy did. So eventually he votes for secession, and he's appointed to the Provisional Confederate Congress. Now, so he's appointed by the secession convention to go to Montgomery as part of a Provisional Confederate Congress. And he proves to be an energetic member of this Provisional Congress. He fights on issues such as Indian affairs. Makes sense if you're from Van Buren. He fights for the judiciary. He becomes an early critic of Davis and his dictatorial powers. And this opposition proved costly. He's earlier in the war here than when Grandison is defeated. So his opposition to Davis becomes a problem. When he stands for a full term, in the Confederate Congress, his opponent is going, to choose, is going to accuse him of not being patriotic. So he's going to be accused of not being patriotic. His opponent, in fact, is going to say that he took too long to embrace secession. And they're going to call his Confederate patriotism into question. But Thomason's going to bounce back in 1866, right after the war. He's going to win a seat in the state legislature. And then he's going to win a seat in the state senate. And he's going to pretty closely hew to that American program. He's going to support internal improvements. He wants to pay the state's debts. Imagine that. He, um, he wants to expand educational facilities in the state. He's going to support the building of the Little Rock and Fort Smith Railroad, for example. And he's going to push for subsidies for that railroad. Now, I should point out he's also on its board of directors, so he will benefit from those subsidies. So some things never change. And then in 1874, he's going to get himself elected to the convention, where he's going to serve on the Judiciary Committee. He's going to serve two terms after that in the State Senate, one term in the State House. So he's going to have a long political career. You'll notice that many of these people who support internal improvements benefit from them. The 1874 convention also had two other governors, future governors, serving in it. In fact, one defeated the other. Um, and that is Governor Henry Massey Rector, the Civil War governor of Arkansas. He had navigated the state through those rocky shoals of secession and in the early years of the war. He's a native of Kentucky, part of the state's dominant political faction. And he came to Arkansas in search of his inheritance, and that's a whole story unto itself. His dad was the federal surveyor of Arkansas, and his dad surveyed out the hot springs, the current hot springs, and claimed them as his own. And they fought a multi-year legal battle in the U.S. Supreme Court over whether the federal government or the Rector family owned hot springs. And he came to Arkansas to claim his inheritance. It didn't work out so well. Um, he lost in the end. He never did achieve federal recognition of his claim. But he was related by marriage. 
to that dominant political organization of the state. And that should have secured him a solid political future. He came from a slaveholding family. He had good political connections. But I don't know another way to put this other than that Henry Rector was kind of a jerk that rubbed people the wrong way. <laughs> the family was, at, was in favor of giving him some minor office, but they didn't want to give him a major office. He gets himself elected, finally, to the Arkansas Supreme Court. And the family's pretty okay with that. But he sought another path. He thought that he should be governor of Arkansas. And the family had other ideas. And so he aligns himself with family critic Thomas C. Heinemann, and he runs as an independent Democrat. And Rector is going to do the unthinkable. He's going to defeat the family candidate for governor. And as governor, he's going to support secession enthusiastically, more so than the convention, keep in mind. But he's, like as I said, he's rubbed people the wrong way. And so in 1861, with the secession convention, they've taken Arkansas out of the Union. They turn their, to their next task, which is to write a new constitution for Arkansas, and they get their revenge. I think this is one of the more amusing stories. Near the end of that convention, they craft a clause that reduces Rector's term from four years to two years. Now keep in mind, they don't reduce the terms of any other state officer, just the governor. And this is their revenge. But Rector, he doesn't play well with others and he doesn't always, he's not very attuned to what's going on. He decides to run anyway. He decides to not accept what I call a paper coup. And so he runs for re-election. Now, after he loses that, after the war, he gets himself elected to the 1874 convention um, where he represents Garland County. Uh, and, and he's not very remarkable during the convention. I mean, he speaks out quite a bit, but nothing major. But the guy who defeated him is just a few seats over from him in the same convention. The 1874 convention places him in close proximity to Harris Flanagan. Flanagan was born in Rhodestown, New Jersey. He's educated at a Quaker school. And it's ironic to me that a guy who was educated by Quakers will become a slaveholder and a Confederate governor. So I find that ironic. In 1860, he owned, when he went to war, he owned seven slaves. He was also very intelligent. At the age of just 18, he became a mathematics professor at Claremont Seminary in Pennsylvania. And he later moved to Illinois where he taught math while he read law. So he's a, he's a bright fellow. He's going to move to Clark County, Arkansas after he reads law. And when, Arcad when Arkadelphia becomes the county seat, he's going to move from Greenville to Arkadelphia. He's going to establish a law practice and a building that, by the way, is still there in Arkadelphia. In 1842, he's going to win election to the state house as a Whig. In 1847, he's going to win election as the militia commander. And you're going to see a pattern here. Military service and political service are going to dictate his life for the next many years. Next, he's elected to the state senate, defeating prominent Democrat Hawes Coleman. And then he got himself elected to the 1861 convention as a unionist. And I'm watching my time here, so we're going to skip ahead a little. He runs for governor against Rector, and it's not clear that he knew he was running for governor. <laughs> a group of prominent Democrats and Whigs placed his name on the ballot while he was in Tennessee with the Army. It's not entirely clear that he knew he was running for governor. As I tell my students, Rector faced a problem that none of us could overcome, even the most skilled politician. If your opponent is on a battlefield in Tennessee, how do you call him an SOB? 
You cannot do it and survive. So Rector could not campaign against Flanagan. And Flanagan's going to win overwhelmingly and be informed by letter that you are the governor-elect of Arkansas. Flanagan is going to become one of the most influential members of the 1874 convention. He's going to chair the Judiciary Committee. So if you've ever cussed the judiciary system of Arkansas, you can go back and blame him. And he and Rector seem to get along perfectly well, so no real problems in the convention there. As governor, I should point out, he had to flee this building twice. Um, and the last time he's going to move the Arkansas capital to what's now historic Washington. He's going to take the records out of this building with him. And after the war, he's going to return those to the Union officers in control um, in a very peaceable manner. So now I want to turn our attention to two Republicans, because I want to I wanted to hit on an African-American delegate and then what I would call a radical carpetbagger Republican delegate. Nine African-Americans served in this body in 1874. But one stands out as the undisputed leader. His name is James T. White. He's a mulatto minister from Phillips County. He's a native of Indiana. His parents were free, so he wasn't born into slavery. He never experienced slavery, but he experienced discrimination. There's no way around that. He knew what it meant to be a second-class citizen. And he's going to come to Arkansas as a soldier in a colored regiment. But he's going to stay in Phillips County. The 1870 Phillips County Census tells us that Phillips County was 68% African American. So he had found a home. His wife is a school teacher. They have no biological children, but they adopted at least one child that we can establish. He was a Baptist minister, editor of a local newspaper, and he represented Phillips County in the 1868 Reconstruction Convention and then was back in 1874. In 1868, he earned a reputation for fairness and for being one of the best orators in the convention. He served as a state representative in 1872 and 1874. And then he was elected to, the state, to be the state commissioner of public works. And Phillips enjoyed, or White, I'm sorry, from Phillips, enjoyed a broad amount of political support. He even had Southern whites who voted for him and pushed him to run as one of three delegates from Phillips County. Now part of that's because he had chosen sides properly. He was in favor of a new constitution in 1874. So he had chosen sides well and he got support because of that. We also know that he is the wealthiest of the nine African-American delegates based on the amount of property that he owned. So I saved what I call our most colorful member for last. And I want, we can dispute all day whether he's a guiding light. And I've totally forgotten my powerful, I apologize. This is, um, there's no image that I know of, of Hugh French Thomason. This is Henry Massey Rector. This is Harris Flanagan, and interestingly enough, I'm not big into genealogy, but based on where he comes from in New Jersey, uh, I've pretty much, I come from two Harris families. My mother's mother was a Harris from one family, and then my, she married a Harris from another family. We have pretty much been able to tie that his mother, who was a Harris, is part of the same family that my mother is part of, because of where they came from in New Jersey. I find that interesting. This is James T. White. I'll point out to you that he looks white. He doesn't look African American. That probably helped him politically. And then our last guy. I mean, and there's your name if you're looking for one. Volley Voltaire Smith. He's one of the most colorful delegates. Now, he may not be enlightened, but he is colorful nonetheless. He is a carpetbagger, even in the most 
color, in the most honest sense of that word. He is a, a carpetbagger. He's born in Rochester, New York in 1842. And like White, he comes here as a soldier and never leaves. He settles in Hempstead County first, where he was a reporter for the Arkansas Post, a radical Republican newspaper. In 1870, he's a Freedman's agent with the Freedman's Bureau in Lafayette County, extreme southern Arkansas. Then he gets himself elected county clerk in Lafayette. And then he gets himself elected to the 1874 convention. In 1870, though, he's amassed quite a bit of wealth. He has $1,600 worth of personal property and $3,000 worth of, pro uh, well, he has 1,600 $1, in personal property and real estate valued at 3,000. So he's done well in Arkansas as a carpetbagger. In 1872, though, when Joseph Brooks and Elijah Baxter fight out that election before the Brooks-Baxter War, he aligns himself with Joseph Brooks. In the end, we all know Baxter wins. After turning this place, that were, this very building, into a war zone, Baxter wins. But he's stuck with Volley Voltaire Smith as his lieutenant governor. And he's opposed to the 1874 Constitutional <clears throat> Convention. He says that it's unconstitutional. But he gets himself elected to it anyway. So he's lieutenant governor and a delegate. And they fight about this for days at the beginning of the convention. And it's determined that, yes, he can hold both offices. So here he is in the convention. And he makes, he honestly, he takes part in the debates, and he actually moves things forward. He's not disingenuous, I'll say, about it. But when the convention is done, when it's time for the voters of Arkansas to vote, he makes an interesting claim. The new Constitution is going to change the terms in office once again, and Baxter is going to step down, and there's going to be an election for governor. He claims that with Baxter stepping down, that as lieutenant governor, he is the rightful governor of Arkansas. And he petitions President Grant to recognize him as governor of Arkansas. And this is going to go on for some time. Now, he doesn't ever take the office by force, like Brooks did. But Grant initially, or finally, I should say, sends him a letter saying, no, I don't think so. And Grant does him a huge favor. He appoints him as an ambassador to a Caribbean island. In other words, let's get you out of Arkansas. In 1888, he's going to return to Arkansas and attempt a political comeback, running for county clerk again in Lafayette, which he loses. And sadly, Smith spends the rest of his life in an insane asylum, um, which I, I don't know. There's nothing to, there's no way to know whether it was just a way to get rid of him or if he truly was insane by this point. But he's going to claim that he is governor for a period of time and that this whole constitutional convention has been unconstitutional. So anyway, I see that we're about out of time. So that pretty much takes care of the delegates I picked. There's 90 of these people. Um, these are some of the most colorful of the group. And these are the guys who framed the constitution we live under today. So that's the big takeaway I want you to have here, that these guys are they're Whigs, they're know-nothings, they're Democrats, they become Green Party candidates, and they are the guys that framed our Constitution today. So anybody have questions for them? Don't make them too hard. <laughs> what, what about the other eight uh, African-Americans? They're a little bit all over the board. Um, Education-wise, they, they hold education is just about comparable to the white delegates. Now, that doesn't always say much. You have to look at the 1868 African Americans, which there were nine also, eight or nine there, and compare those to the 74. And I mean, they're very competent legislators, despite what previous historians have told us. And were, were most of them born in Arkansas? No, from most of them were from elsewhere. Um, the guy by the last name of Gray, for example, who served as the first superintendent of education of Arkansas. Uh, grew up in Virginia and Washington, D.C. and eventually came to Arkansas. And if you go to the, 
to Old Main at the U of A and you, we have the, the deed, or not the deed, but the construction paperwork where they started construction on the building, he got to sign that because he's the chairman of the Board of Trustees in 1870, 1872, 1872-1872. Um, Arkansas never had an African American majority. So those old claims from South Carolina and Mississippi, Louisiana, that, oh, we're gonna be under black rule is the way they would have put that. They didn't hold a lot of weight in Arkansas because there was very little chance of that. So the racial climate, while bad, wasn't as bad as, say, Louisiana or South Carolina or Mississippi. Anyone else? Yes. Is it true that African Americans uh, were legislated in Arkansas until the early 1890s? Absolutely, until 1893. Um, in fact, I gave that presentation a few months ago at a community college in Northeast Arkansas for Black History Month, that African Americans held office in Arkansas until 1893 uh, and could vote in Arkansas until after 1900 in some places still. How's it other uh, It's about the same in most of them. In fact, I have an article I wrote several years ago about South Carolina and the number of African Americans until ben, Pitchfork Ben Tillman's gonna to become governor and end it there in the 18, late 1800s. So yeah, um, the idea that we just immediately ended black participation, that, that doesn't quite fit. Now, did they get elected everywhere? No. But places like Chico County, Deshea County, Lafayette County, Ashley County, Places where you had African American majorities, you still, and they held local office too, county judge, county sheriff. So, I think one thing that there's been a lack of interest, focus on reconstruction. I blame it on people like me when we teach it that we are required to teach so many things, and we divide American history into two parts. And so, the first part I'm supposed to teach from the beginning. And I mean, we would take it back to Native Americans, to 1876. So I'm supposed to cover Reconstruction. And somewhere around this point in the semester, I don't teach that half typically, I teach the other half. Somewhere around this point in the semester, you look up and you go, oh crap, I am just now getting to the Civil War. I do not have time to teach Reconstruction. <laughs> so most people don't even know anything about Reconstruction, is my argument. <laughs> Despite the fact that great historians like Eric Foner write about Reconstruction all the time. And I have the great pleasure to, to be studying under a guy who was trained by Eric Foner at all, so at the U of A. So, but I think it just gets lost. And plus, don't forget that a whole generation of historians, they didn't want to write about it. That's why we don't know about African Americans serving until 1893. We wrote that out of our history to some extent. There's a guy named Dunning who taught at Columbia University, and he was a contemporary of Woodrow Wilson. And we literally wrote it out of our history. And we made the ones who did, that we do admit serve sound like buffoons. I hate to use the word, but we made them sound like buffoons. Okay, anybody else? Yes? When was the poll tax? The poll tax is gonna come about um, as part of this effort to limit African-American voting. But I should go back and say that Arkansas and most states always had one, but we changed the purpose. Um, in 1836, you would have paid a poll tax of a dollar probably to vote, but it would have all gone to education. So we're gonna change that purpose. And we're gonna use a poll tax, a literacy test, um, a grandfather clause, now, Arkansas, I don't believe, ever used a grandfather clause. But Mississippi, for example, did. If your grandfather could vote, then you could vote. Well, if your grandfather was a slave, then you're out of luck. Um, my favorite's the literacy test, that you have to read something to me and tell me that you under, make me think you understand it. Well, that's very subjective. subjective. That's right. Okay. Anybody else? Was that just in Arkansas, what you just said, or other states? Other states, across the South, they use combinations of that. 
South Carolina, for example, used multiple polling boxes to confuse you. So you might put your ballot in the wrong box <laughs> if you couldn't read. Right. Now we used a, and I, I'm a Southern historian, so I always like to point out, this is not just a Southern thing though. In the North at the same time, we're treating immigrants the same way. And in the American West, we're treating Hispanics the same way. I think the South gets a bad reputation sometimes, and that's one of the things my dissertation points out is, these things are going on around the country. It's not just the South. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>